Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real geniuses. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast, uh, Health Medicine and Bioscience Edition. Uh, my goal is to find the geniuses in the, their fields and bring them to you, the listeners. And I've interviewed over 2,000 people the past three years, uh, scientists, clinicians, researchers, etc. Today I have Martin Nielsen. He's an associate professor at University of Kentucky. Uh, he's an equine veterinarian, amongst other things, uh, years of experience in Denmark. Um, he worked actually in equine parasitology. So we're going to be talking about uh, possibly equine parasitology, but maybe parasitology in general. So, Martin, thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, tell me about your uh, your research, if you would. Yeah, so um, so as you said, my program focuses or specializes in in horse uh, parasites and all aspects of of horses uh, and their parasites. And and the I'm at the Glug Equine Research Center here at the University of Kentucky. So we have a, a research center here that's that's uh, entirely focused on everything the horse. Uh, you know, different faculty members with different programs in different areas, spanning from uh, genetic uh, conditions to uh, reproduction and bacterial, viral, parasit- uh, parasitological issues, and just things that uh, horse owners are dealing with, uh, you know, when they have horses. Parasites is just one of those things that they always have. Regardless of what you do, horses will get parasites. And that's a constant consideration when you manage horses, own horses, you have to somehow deal with the parasites. Um, and so, you know, uh, I'll never really run out of, of need or, or questions to answer, but my, my, my mission is uh, to provide solutions for equine parasite control. So that's, that's really what we do. We, we test and evaluate possible uh, new uh, dewormers, new anthemitics. Uh, we do have a, a big issue of drug resistance. So and that the current products are, are slowly running out. And, and, and once we have resistance developed, um, those will never you know, be useful again. It's not a matter of just waiting a few years and then all the uh, parasites will be susceptible again. So once resistance has developed, it stays. And we do a lot of projects to investigate what the mechanisms are, you know, what are the genes, what's happening when you get all this resistance. Um, And then uh, we work a lot on diagnostic tests. So uh, we need to better diagnose and monitor the parasites and know when to treat and when to not treat and then which animals to treat. And these are issues that certainly are applying to horses, but these are also concepts that, you know, are being discussed with other animals and even in humans in developing countries where there's also you know, parasite deworming programs in in a place for public health. And, you know, whether you should just deworm everybody all the time. And we know we've done that in veterinary medicine for a long time. And all we got out of that exercise was just a whole lot of resistant worms. So, so that's a, that's a big part of what I do. And then we do evaluate uh, different uh, protocols, different parasite control programs. And so there's a whole bunch of different ways you can approach parasite control on a horse farm. And so which is the best way to do that? And is it going to be the same in every single horse farm? Uh, you know, what are the differences, sizes uh, of uh, numbers of horses, age groups, and also different climates? So um, we're doing all of that in a bunch of different projects. So we're busy. Nope. How does a parasite, when you said it develops resistance, what does it develop resistance to? The drugs that you're trying to use to treat it or are yeah. there other kinds of changes? It's, that it drug, drug resistance, uh, just like you see in bacteria with the antibiotics. Uh, we certainly also see that with the, with the parasites, the worms, and the uh, dewormers, the anthemintic products that we are treating them with. So they just like genetically become resistant and uh, are then – tolerant to the treatment so the treatment no longer kills the parasites and they survive and uh, might even accumulate in the in animals and that's where the animals you know are at risk of developing health issues uh, because of that because of the parasite infections so what's um with the parasites that, that horses tend to get what do they do to them 
you know, are the parasites all killers or what do they do to the horses? So that's a great question. Uh, and that's also a big uh, part of the, the work that we do. We try to really uh, is describe uh, and establish exactly how the parasites affect their horses and actually uh, also the other way around. Um, the, the parasites that I work with are all intestinal parasites. So I have um, the roundworms and the uh, tapeworms that we work on, and they all live in the intestinal tract of the horses. Uh, and then within that intestinal tract, there's a couple different manifestations that you can typically see when a horse has parasitic disease. Uh, one category is what we call colic. So colic is a symptom. It's a clinical sign. It's really just a sign of stomach pain. And it could be from anywhere in the intestinal tract, but that is certainly something that parasites can cause. And in some cases, colics, uh, in many cases, colics do require uh, a veterinary treatment and sometimes even admission to a hospital and in some cases surgery. Um, and so that can be... Uh, you know, costly and also life-threatening to the horse. And then the other category that we see that parasites are associated with is um, uh, diarrhea. So basically an enteritis, an inflammatory condition of the intestinal tract that leads to diarrhea. Uh, with diarrhea, if that goes on for, um, you know, any period of time, then you get loss of nutrients, you get damage to the intestinal wall, and you get loss of protein, you get a whole lot of different things, and loss of fluid, if nothing else, and di a dehydration. So, so those are the two main categories of disease that we see, uh, see caused by, by, the, by these parasites. So what's interesting or unique about the mechanisms of uh, parasitism that you're observing? Um, I think one of the things that I find very interesting, uh, and others as well, is is we, we talk about, you know, how parasites are critters, bugs that get inside your animals, and then they do bad things. And that's certainly also the case. Um, one thing we do have to keep in mind, though, is that in a whole majority of cases, it's just a natural state for animals to have parasites. And we sometimes seem to forget that uh, just it's just as normal for horses to have parasites as it is for those same horses to have bacteria within their intestinal tract. And they all have bacteria. We know that we all have bacteria. It's microbiome. It's normal. Parasites are just as normal. The difference often is that you can see the parasites and some of them look gross. And so we don't like the thought of the parasites. But in the large majority of cases, the parasites actually don't do anything. It's not in their interest to actually cause any harm to their hosts. That's their house. That's where they live. That's the source of nutrients. They are dependent on those hosts in order to complete their life cycle. So it doesn't really make sense for them to you know, kill them or cause sickness or disease. So it's only when you know, balances sort of shift out of balance and, and a horse can get overwhelmed by parasites for a number of different reasons that we see this this disease and what's an interesting thing um, that's been described mostly in humans and then also in uh, some uh, rodent models is that um, parasites might actually help decrease um, things like um, asthma and autoimmune disease this has been shown in people we don't really see that in horses but so so these inflammatory conditions that seem to be when when the immune system is is out of balance, you know maybe what's helping to keep the immune system in balance is actually presence of some parasites. Uh, a lot of allergic conditions uh, are not found really in people in developing countries. Uh, asthma, as one example, we don't really see that much in um, kids in Africa, for example. And well, what, what do you think a parasite is doing? It's it we I mean, know it that wants to survive, so it probably excludes other things that would normally infect the person or the creature, but what's well, any mechanisms that you observe? It, it, it modulates the immune system and the immune response, and it, it, it dampens, reduces the inflammatory response or alters it. And so, and that's certainly in its own interest because the inflammatory response, the inflammation that the host organism, the host animal or, or, or person is mounting to that parasite, that is actually meant to you know, uh, excrete the parasite, kick it out of the system, get rid of it. And so it certainly is in the interest of that parasite to release substances that that lowers that response, that alters it, that modulates it. And, you know, those um, effects can sometimes be beneficial. Um, and we, we have actually shown that in horses as well, that parasites do release these substances that are 
altering the uh, inflammatory response. And, and then, you know, the conditions I was talking about just before, the asthma, the autoimmune conditions, like things like Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel syndrome in people, those are all very inflammatory conditions. And, you know, in the cases of the inflammatory bowel syndrome in people, it's not anything I work with. I just find this interesting. If you give those people worms, they get better. And this has been shown scientifically. And so, you know, that's food for thought, at least. Now, with animals, with livestock, uh, cattle, sheep, goats, and also horses, we will never get in the situation uh, that we have with people where, you know, people grow up without any parasites at all. And horses, goats, sheep, cattle, they all have parasites all the time, uh, more or less. So, so, so we don't have that parasite-free state, and then we'll never get to it. So, so this, the situation is a little bit different in, in veterinary medicine. Uh, we, we don't really have parasites causing, you know, inflammatory bowel syndrome or lack of parasites causing anything like that. But we do see this modulation going on. And it's a big part of my research program as well, that we're characterizing that exactly what's happening. What are the modulators? What are the substances that are being released from the parasites? And how's that interplay going with the host immune response? Well, how do you, what, what kind of interaction do you see with the parasite and the, the uh, host's immune system? And does it happen immediately or is it, you know, based upon the stage that the parasite's in? Um, we, we see there's, there's a difference. To, uh, so parasites typically have um, different phases of the life cycle. So we have the adult parasites that are the worms that live in the intestinal tract. But then for the most part, before that, they, uh, when they enter their host, they're actually larvae. They're immature stages. They're like the, the youngsters, the kids, and they go through different phases before they finally become adults. And some of them actually have a migration uh, within the body of the host, like in the tissue, where they migrate through various organs or sometimes in the bloodstream. And um, that, depending on how they migrate and where they migrate, um, some of them actually undergo arrested development and stay in a certain spot for a period of time that could be longer or shorter periods of time. All of that will have different impacts on the local immune reaction in that very tissue. Um, and then uh, once they get into the intestinal tract, they're a little bit more remote from all of the host immune response. And, and it seems that they have less impact um, on, on the actual host immune response. But there's, it's, it's interesting, certainly, with that when they're in that tissue, there's, there's a very complicated uh, interplay going on. And I, I, think, <clears throat> I don't think we can really claim that we fully understand exactly all of what's going on uh, there just yet. But, you know, uh, one of the questions we have is this arrested development. So basically parasites get getting to a certain stage of the life cycle and then they just stop. They seize and they just sit there and they can do that for like years at the time. What are the mechanisms there? Is it something that the parasites are programmed to or is it really triggered by the host immune response and what leads them to then continue or resume development uh, at a certain point later on. Um, we are only beginning to understand that we have developed uh, a computer simulation of the entire, uh, one of the major parasites in horses and the entire life cycle of that and all of the, all of the knowledge we have from all of the studies that have been done in terms of uh, how they progress from stage to stage in the life cycle, how the host immune response may play a role, uh, and uh, also actually uh, what might happen when you go in and treat with, a, with various products. And, and that has helped us to at least make, make some steps forward in that, you know, understanding exactly what is it that's going on. Uh, and I think we're, we're probably, certainly we have some ideas uh, that would change fundamentally a little bit the thinking we've had about how this all happens, how this all works out in these parasites. Do you, what about the mechanisms of communication? Do you, do you know if parasites uh, release like extracellular vesicles or take yes, them they in? Do. Yes, they do. And microRNA. Yeah. And that's a, that's a, that's really an emerging area of research. Like just within the last maybe five years, we've seen people starting to unravel that and characterize that. We have a project right now on one of the parasites, one of the migrating stages. Uh, we have one parasite that migrates in the blood. We call it the blood worm. And we have a project with the uh, University of Copenhagen um, where uh, we are characterizing those, those vesicles, what's in them, and uh, microRNAs and other, you know, other cargo that is in those vesicles and what that does. And in a lot of cases, um, those have been shown to contain um, things that 
uh, suppress the, or modulate the host immune response. So yes, very much. Uh, it's been described in, in veterinary parasites. Um, the most work has been done at this point in, um, in a large roundworm of pigs, Ascaris suum, which is very closely related to uh, another parasite that's infecting people. Actually, the one in the pigs can also infect people. It's a zoonotic parasite. So there's been a lot of work done with that. And, and we're kind of piggybacking onto that with uh, some of the horse parasites and asking some of the same questions to see what we might find there. So, yeah, that's a collaboration we have with my friends in Denmark. I'm, I'm from Denmark myself. Nice. So cool. I have a good, strong connection there. So, um, and they do have a lot of uh, work in that area there. So I have a lot of expertise. What's our, what about the uh, microbiome? of the parasites have yeah. you looked at that yes Do they have their own yes well we 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 certainly think so we have a one of my phd students is actually doing exactly that as we speak i as on my way to my office right now i just passed by the lab and she was in there pipetting pcr uh, place so she is working on that very question um no one has done that with any other equine parasites thus far just mapping out do those parasites have their own microbiome and is it different from the microbiome of the guest, you know, in the intestinal content from where they were collected. And so we, she's doing that. She's doing that with uh, the large roundworm of horses. That's an ascarid parasite. So it's, it's related to uh, the ones I just talked about in the pigs, but it's just one that's specific for the horses. It was a good place to start because those parasites are pretty large. So they're easy to collect. They're also easy to dissect. So we're going to look at specific tissues from these worms, not just whole worms, but like intestines versus gonads versus uh, cuticle or body muscle and things like that. Uh, I don't have any results that, just now, but she is um, getting ready to submit uh, her material for sequencing, uh, maybe even later this week. So that's something we're working on right now as we speak. We know from some parasites, um, uh, filarial worms, uh, both in uh, animals and people, and also some mosquitoes, that they have endosymbionts. So that's bacteria that live within the, the organism, within the parasite or the mosquito. And um, there seems to be a, a, a sort of a symbiosis relationship. So it's to the benefit of the parasite. And if you treat with an antibiotic to kill this, this bacteria, it's a Wolbachia bacteria, um, then the parasites actually struggle and die. And so um, that's been shown for some of the heartworms that we see in dogs, for example, that you treat with an antibiotic plus a dewormer at the same time, you get a more effective treatment. So, so that's just one example of one genus of parasites, or sorry, of bacteria within parasites. Uh, and we're, we would be very surprised if we did not find at least a few examples of, of that also in other um, parasites. I know recently, just a year and a half ago, a group out of New Zealand published a major paper describing that for one major parasites of sheep and goats, uh, one called Haemonchus contortus, which is like the most problematic deadly parasite um, there and they mapped out the entire microbiome of those parasites at different stages of the parasites so very elegant work and so yeah you're asking a, a very pertinent question and one that people are actually working on right now yeah interesting stuff we also uh, have questions about the relationship between the intestinal microbiome of the animal and what parasites are there because you know we think that probably there should be some kind of communication going on back and forth. And like the microbiome might affect the parasites. The parasites might very well also affect the microbiome, but exactly how and what. And so, you know, that's probably uh, many years of work in ahead of us, but, you know, with current technology and all the sequencing uh, technology we now have, it's so much more feasible to get this kind of information. So we have a big uh, project that we finished in the fall where we collected material from a large number of horses and have a collaborator uh, working with us doing microbiomes on those horses. And we're then doing what we call the nematode. So that's just nematodes, i.e. Mm -hmm. the parasites. We're mapping out what parasites are there and we're going to hold that up against what uh, the microbiomes look like. And we're going to do that, not just fecal, not just a fecal sample from those animals, but actually from the different intestinal compartments. Um, so a pretty comprehensive study there. <clears throat> so we're hoping to learn a whole lot there, probably get confused at, at an even higher level, which is fun. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> Question. Um, 
So in a definitive host or an intermediate host, any major differences in, you know, extracellular vesicle composition or output or the attached microbiome, which you probably don't know yet. No, but, um, but those are, know, those are, it would be interesting to see that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and those would be, those would be obvious next questions, right? I mean, so most of the parasites that I work with are, do not have an intermediate host. They, they have a, an external phase where they're, they're out there on pasture and then go through some development and then they get ingested by the animals and then they have their parasitic phase. The only difference, uh, the only exception is the tapeworm. Tapeworms almost always have an intermediate host and the ones in horses also uh, do have an intermediate host. And that's a little, uh, little dung mite um, that we actually don't know a whole lot about. And there's a lot of questions that could be asked there, uh, as you point out. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Enough to keep us busy. Yeah. <laughs> So what do you think, um, I don't know, any breakthroughs that you're on the verge of, or do you think that, you know, again, uh, figuring out the microbiome of, of parasites will be a big uh, turning point? Like, what, what do you think is going to be some of the big drivers of uh, success? Um, well, I think what's going to be a big uh, breakthrough is, is hard to tell when you're in the middle of it. Sometimes it's just a matter of going, you know, we, we need this information in order to sort of make the next steps or decide what the next steps step should be. Um, but it's hard to really know how significant something is going to be before you actually have it. Um, and I think that goes for a lot of this, which is just like, okay, we need all this information. We're probably going to halfway drown ourselves in information for a while until we sort of, you know, learn how to navigate and all that and, and find out to make, how to make meaningful, how to make meaning of it. Um, so I think that work needs to just continue and we'll get back up to the surface at some point, but maybe not tomorrow. And I, and I think on, on breakthroughs, um, you know, I, I, I don't know what's a breakthrough. We, we do think that one of the big needs in veterinary medicine uh, in general is just, we need more, we need more um, product. We need more dewormers. Uh, we haven't really seen much new developed over the past decades. Uh, so we've, we've been stuck with the same old products that have been out there for decades and we have so much resistance to them. And it seems like it takes a very long time for the pharmaceutical industry to develop new products. And that's becoming a crisis. Um, we have some work in my lab with a collaborator, um, some collaborators actually uh, out of um, University of Massachusetts where we work with a bacterial dewormer. It's a, it's a protein that's produced by free living bacteria. And that protein we've tested in horses. Uh, other collaborators have tested them in other animals. And we do have good evidence that they actually kill the worms, uh, at least um, some worms, uh, some of the different species. We've done a study in foals where those same ascrit parasites that I talked about before, we, we basically knocked them out with, with this protein, a formulation of this bacterial protein. So maybe that could become a new treatment modality. I think, I think we def desperately need something, and that's certainly something that, is, has, that holds some promise for us. So maybe that could be a breakthrough, that we could be part of a biological dewormer that you know, maybe finds use uh, in the future. Um, another well, question, thing we, question, but, question, hmm? question here. What, um, dewormers, do they, are they, do they act like just broad-spectrum antibiotics? Or how do they work? as a deworming agent? Um, so we have three different pharmaceutical classes. Um, two of them uh, have a mode of action that's paralyzing the worm. So they're interacting with certain receptors uh, that the worms have and that mammalians don't have. So, so they're not toxic at, at least within that dose range that we uh, administer to the animals. And so they paralyze the worms and then the worms um, get flushed out really from the intestinal tract. They come out in the open and they die. Uh, a third category doesn't paralyze the worms, but it interferes with the metabolism of the worms and it actually sort of blocks it. So in a way you could say it starves the worms to death and, uh, and they, the, the end result is the same. They get flushed out. And so, um, so three different categories there that do that. And um, so it's not an antibiotic, it's an anthelmintic. So essentially the same idea, it just kills worms instead of bacteria. Yeah. But again, is it very targeted or is it broad spectrum where it's going to uh, cause all kinds of other problems in the body? Well, um, 
we one of the that's actually one question we have as well and in, in, in that most recent project that I talked about with the microbiome that study actually um, we treated horses some horses and some we lived untreated so we had untreated controls we, and then we had two different treatment groups so we're able to establish how the microbiome might change in response to a deworming and so dewormers do should not have a direct antibiotic uh, effect, but you know how uh, it's not really been looked into very much, and so you can't rule out that it might have. It might alter the microbiome. Maybe it does it indirectly through killing the worms. That could actually lead to a change of the microbiome. So we're looking to basically establish that. How does a microbiome in healthy horses change when you deworm them, and does it? Is it depending on? what you deworm them with. Those are two questions we have and that we're currently addressing and within the next year or so, we'll, we'll get a little closer to the answer. Nobody's ever looked at that. Uh, I'm not aware of anything like that from other parasite host systems either. So again, this is something that's just become possible to do in recent years with the you know, in, improved sequencing technologies and also more affordable teaching uh, uh, in sequencing technologies that enable us to, to start asking, asking these questions. So that's, that's an interesting one. I mean, there's a lot of interesting stuff. Another thing I want to mention is <clears throat> on the diagnostic side, um, very traditionally in, in veterinary medicine, the way to uh, diagnose parasite infections in animals is to get a fecal sample, a stool sample, and then you have a parasite egg counting technique that you apply that entails you mixing the sample up in something and then you put it in a counting chamber and then you put it under the microscope and you sit there with your little clicker and then you count the net, the number of eggs and then you have a multiplication factor and you, you arrive at a number of eggs, parasite eggs per gram of feces and that's your result. That's been, it's been like that for over a hundred years. That's one, that's how, you know, veterinarians, parasitologists have diagnosed parasites in animals. We have developed a system that does it automatically. It's, it's based on an app, obviously. Um, it, you know, we take a picture of the sample where we have the uh, X stained with a fluorescent dye, so they stand out on the picture, and then we use image analysis to count the X, and we validated that. Um, it's very precise. It has less variation than it has when you have the human error being part of it, like the same person doing egg counts for the entire day. They, you know, they get tired in the end. They probably don't perform you know, equally well throughout the day. And, and we have the system that does it the exact same way every time. So we've been able to increase the diagnostic precision substantially. And also it's much quicker, you know, typically in order to do one of those manual fecal egg counts, you, you need, if you're quick, you can maybe finish one in 15 minutes. We can do it in two and a half. And so you can get more done more quickly and you can do them right away. You don't have to package the sample and ship them somewhere or bring them home to your lab. I mean, you can even bring that thing on your on your veterinary truck and do them right on site if you need to. So, you know, whether that's a breakthrough or not, I we certainly hope so. It's, it's, it's now a product that we're beginning to sell and we just started that a few months ago. At least I think it's, it's, and it's, it's a suggestion of what the future might look like when it comes to diagnosing and monitoring for parasites. So, yeah, no, that's excellent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, is it worth it for a uh, horse or other animal to keep a certain parasite? Are there any that you found that are just so beneficial against so many other things that even though they, you know, they're not great for the uh, creature to have that, that, you know, it's not an easy equation to say just get rid of it. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a that's a fundamental question um, that I think is the right question to ask. I don't think we have the full detail answer to it yet. I th I think there's something to that. There's something to the whole concept of you know we're not in the game of eradicating the parasites. We can't do that. It's not an attainable goal. It shouldn't be a desirable goal. Uh, yet I think that's what you know, that's been the mistake of the past that we've tried to do that. And all we got out of that was, was resistance. And then we lose the ability to treat an animal that might need a treatment. For the most part, as I said in the beginning, these, these parasites do, don't really do anything bad in the animals. But there are like individual situations where that can happen. And I think as a proof in point, one of the resources, research resources that 
we have here at the University of Kentucky is a herd of horses, a, a research herd that I inherited. It's, it was here when I came. Um, it's actually been here since 1979. It's been kept the same population of horses through several generations of horses. They've been kept on the same pasture, the same premises without deworming. So we're now year two, 2020. So it's 41 years this year with no deworming at all. These horses are doing just fine. And they have a lot of parasites because that's one thing I can say because I study these horses. They do have a lot of parasites. They also even have some of the parasites that you would say, you know, that's a parasite we would rather not have in our horses, like the blood worm that I mentioned before, one that migrates in the blood tissue, blood vessels, and causes a lot of damage there. It is it is considered one of the more pathogenic parasites. Um, and yet all of these horses have it, and I don't see any disease associated with that parasite. I do see lesions in those horses, but, you know, that's not the same as disease. So I think it, I think that herd is teaching us or reminding us that, you know, exactly what I said in the beginning, the parasites are not in the game to kill their, hearse, their, their hosts. It's not in their interest. Yet it can happen under certain circumstances where, you know, an animal can be overwhelmed by parasites, by maybe, you know, immunosuppression, maybe it has other disease, maybe there is an inf increased infection pressure because of how the pastures are managed or not managed or overstocking too many animals on too little space. Uh, a lot of these things can play a role. Um, but for the most part, you know, that's not what the parasites do. Um, and so um, with all the work we talked about just before with how the microbiome may look like in healthy animals, I think when we get that information, we'll start, be, we'll start knowing more and we'll start, you know, being able to maybe answer that question better, you know, to which extent are these pa parasites actually part of keeping horses healthy? Um, I think what we see now, uh, I can say at least this, and this is something I observe in that herd particularly, is that the older the animals get, the older the horses get, the fewer parasites they have. So there is some degree of immunity. Uh, they do immunize themselves um, by being exposed. And so if you are you know, too aggressive with your deworming and you want to prevent that exposure, you might actually end up with animals that are very, very susceptible to, to parasite infections. And that could be one of the reasons why we sometimes see disease and why I don't see disease in that particular herd. So I think that's... Uh, just food for thought doesn't mean that I yeah, recommend um, not to deworm, uh, you know, right, right. at all. Uh, but I think it's just a reminder still that you know they're not as bad as we sometimes think. Well, if you can get them to go into a dormant state and they still somehow provide protection to the, yep. the host, you know, maybe yep. that's the best thing you can get instead yep. of just trying to get rid of them. That's a, that that's a good do, point. Um, yeah. Do do parasites have uh, their own viruses, or I don't know if they call them phages, or whatever they call them. Excellent question. Um, they probably do. I don't, to my knowledge, and, and you're not the first to ask to ask me this question. I, I do have some uh, colleagues here who are like virus people, and they ask me that very same question. Um, they probably very likely do, and I don't think that's been established very much or looked at very much in veterinary parasitology, at least. Um, I mean, there's probably some papers, but not something that I've seen a whole lot of, and and there's also probably in their genomes evidence of viral DNA that's been incorporated into the genomes, uh, just like we've seen in like the human genome and the mammalian genomes, for example. Now, we're a little bit behind in the world of parasitology in terms of getting those full genomes uh, sequenced and assembled and annotated. Um, and so, in, especially in the horse world, we are only beginning to get the first full genomes now uh, for some of the major parasites. And so that's something that we'll know much more, more about in the next few years. So it's interesting, like this whole conversation is like, you know, uh, I've been talking about all the new information we're going to get. Um, so we're, you know, we're stepping into the modern era of science also in the world of parasitology, probably you've talked to so many other scientists and you, you would probably agree when I say that, you know, we're a little bit later. I don't, I don't want to use the word behind necessarily, but we're certainly a little bit later to do some of these things than you must have come across with other disciplines, but we are going. Well, I, think in it's, um, I don't think people appreciate the web of life that, you know, bacteria have viruses. Yeah. Parasites probably do. Parasites have their own microbiome. Parasites excrete extracellular vesicles just like cells do. 
It's like yeah. bacteria do. I mean, it's, there's these common themes amongst all life. doesn't exactly. matter the form that yeah. I'm seeing. So that's why I'm, I'm just at least aware of these things. But yeah, you, you, just like other scientists, I mean, you have so much to do. It's like 50 lifetimes, I understand. Yeah. But, you know, you know at least that's what keeps it exciting. It does. And I, I also think, um, I don't know. Yeah, well, I guess I guess I kind of, I came through with my PhD um you know, I, I graduated in 2007, so it's not not that long ago. And, and but it's long enough ago that that was during a time where this this next gen sequencing didn't exist, and this whole idea of getting entire genomes sequenced and and you know annotated was something that was going on, but was like huge tasks and required like big consortia of people working on the human genome. And and you know, 2008 they published the the horse genome for the first time. So so you know, I'm I'm old and I'm young enough to say this. You know, I haven't been in this business for that long, but I'm old enough to say that I was actually I trained prior to the current era that we're in with with all the omics, right? We didn't talk about the omics back then. So, so by, you know, back then, I think maybe with some of that kinds of work, the kinds of work that people were doing, they were like, okay, we can, we, we can't really get any further with a lot of this. We don't know a whole lot and we can kind of repeat some of the same studies, but we can't make any, we can't really make like huge progress. And now all of a sudden we're in a situation where we're like, we're going to get so much more information. It's going to go, it's going to confuse us a lot. It's going to be really complicating, complicated to, to deal with and to organize and to analyze and, and, and finally get back up to the surface and rise up in that drone and, and get the big overview. But it's going to allow us to make huge steps forward and, and talk about some of those relationships that I, that you just talked about there. I agree. Those are really, really fascinating things to think about that within the parasites are other little parasites. And who knows if those parasites also have parasites and where does it even end? And what are the bigger implications of that? Um, this is fascinating stuff. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. what if there's like, you know, what if there are viruses that endogenize to the parasite and come out only when it's in like the definitive host, for instance. I mean, yeah. there's all kinds of crazy things yeah. that could be happening. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we, we have no clue. And it's, it's, it's really amazing to think of all the work, all the research that's been done in my field and I guess all fields. And yet we're, we, we're, we're sitting here and talking about how little we know. <laughs> um, yeah, well, it's always like that. So. Yeah. At least you have an open-mindedness to it and appreciation instead of like mm. being fixated on oh, a small molecule drug. We just yeah. got to find the next one. I, you know, I, I just see yeah. a lot of scientists going down probably blind alleys for years because they don't bother to even consider that there's a much bigger picture to what they're doing. Yeah, I, th I think in science in general and um, something I have observed and I'm probably guilty of myself to some extent is is you when you when you worked in a in an area for some time you 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 have your comfort zone like things that you know you can do well and that you're comfortable doing and you know the techniques and you know how to work with them and interpret them and analyze the data and get your papers published and so there's some bias to that sometimes because i think as human nature we're sometimes you know prone to just sticking to that and not always stepping into the big scary unknown i mean and i try to force myself to do two step in, in in areas that I'm not even trained in. I don't know anything about bioinformatics. Uh, I find I find this this like stepping into a big ocean without really knowing how to swim. Um, but you know, you you gotta at least try a little bit and do something and um, and keep challenging yourself also. Um, and and at least you know our department and I think most departments uh, that I know of they they've chosen to hire somebody who knows about bioinformatics. We have a new guy here. He's been with us for a year now and, and um, that's what he does. He doesn't have a lab. He just has a big computer and, and he's there to work with us and, and hopefully, you know, make us help us advance into this big ocean and make sure that we find out how to swim through it. So. Well, very good. Yeah. Well, Martin, I, I appreciate you coming. Um, <clears throat> tell me what's the best way for people to find out more about your work in your lab. So uh, I've got a couple of things. Um, you know, I I try one of the things that's very very important to me is like everything we talked about today is, is something that I am passionate about and and find you know very important. But I also really try to communicate about what I do on social media. 
I think it's important, and I want to leave this this podcast with this. I think as scientists in this day and age, it's an obligation to communicate in all possible platforms, and that includes social media. And I emphasize this because I see a lot of reluctance uh, amongst some of my colleagues, <clears throat> not all, to do so. But I think you have to meet the people where the people are, and today people are on social media. So you can find me on Twitter at Martin K. Nielsen. Just make sure you spell Nielsen the Danish way, N-I-E-L-S-E-N. I tweet about what we do here um, So if you like horse parasites or you have an interest in parasites or parasitology, you can follow me there. I also have a uh, YouTube channel. I, uh, I do some videos. I did a whole series of videos, 18 videos this fall on, under the title Deworm Debunk. I saw you asked about are there common myths and misconceptions that you come across? And the answer is a big yes. And you can watch that video series and I take them one and one at a time and debunk them. Uh, so if you go on to That's my great. YouTube, which is M uh, Martin K. Nielsen Equine Parasitology, <clears throat> you can find all my videos there. So, and then, of course, if you just go to the Gluck Equine Research Center website, you Google that and you'll find a faculty page. You can find my faculty profile with my contact information, email, etc. It's all there. So. Right, great. Well, I just subscribed to your YouTube channel, so I get to watch. <laughs> okay, cool. Excellent. Well, cool. Well, Martin, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com.